Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from one of our special guests. Are you ready for the Word of God tonight? I'm going to be just bringing a message to you that's a very uh, unusual message. I don't think I've ever brought something quite like this before, so um, hold on to your seats. I don't even know how it will go. I'm hoping that, uh, that we can uh, be able to, to get through it without it uh, you know, uh, doing too much gymnastics to our minds, but I think it's healthy for us to, um, to look at not just the Word of God, but to look at, you know, um, our, our existing natural world and, and, and the things that the Bible says that God tells us He's there by the things that we see in the world around us. So um, I've called this message Attracting God. And it's sort of an unusual title because, you know, how do you attract God? And it's... Um, you know, there are things in the scriptures, the Bible says, that, you know, you can repel God. The Bible says God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. So one attracts him and one repels him. If you have a proud spirit and a proud heart and an arrogant spirit, you will repel God. But if you have a contrite heart and you have a humble heart, you will attract God. And so I want us to look at some things, um, you know, and it really comes out of the last uh, number of months and even... Pastor Luke preached on it this morning, dealing with, you know, that we meet God on His terms, not on our terms. Amen. And there's been such a tremendous sense in my spirit and my heart of that God does not have any favorites. He does not have any, you know, special people who get special dispensations and special, you know, rules. Uh, um, the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons, that God is, uh, you know, we're all on an equal playing field. And that we all have to come before God His way. And there's nobody, nobody who has an exception to that. We all have to enter by the blood of the Lamb. We have to uh, accept the Savior. We have to realize there is no entrance into the presence of God except through Jesus Christ. There just is no other way. That's God's terms. He's laid them down. And you can say, well, I'm just this good-looking God, and this, I'm this, I'm that. You're not going to have any uh, success. And... and you know, it, it, it has marveled me over the years to, to see um, the areas of life that people think that, you know, well, this happened to everybody else, but it's not going to happen to me. Well, the bottom line of it is, you know what? We're all part of the human race, and we're all part of humanity. And when I was growing up as a child, you know, we all watched those high school videos where they showed us the impact of drugs, and we saw... That we, the statistics that 100 million people who took heroin, they all ruined their lives, they all messed up their finances, they all messed up their families, and they all you know, brought destruction to their homes. But somehow, people every day seem to think that they can be the exception. That somehow, it, 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 everybody else ruined their life, but not them. And they keep trying it. And I'm thinking, no, I, I saw what that happened to everybody else, so I don't want to be a part of the same you know, pattern. And so we have the sense that somehow, you know, um, people, we have an exception, but nobody has an exception. But understanding that because there's no respect of persons with God, and because we're all in the same playing field, and because God has set the rules, and we are the ones who are abiding by them, as we come before God, there are ways, and even though God is not a respecter of persons, He is a respecter of certain things. He's a respecter, as we talked about, of humility. That's one thing that he respects. We start off in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, in a scripture that we're going to get to very soon. We're in Hebrews 11, 4, as a congregation. But Hebrews 11, 6 is coming, and it's the classic uh, proof scripture. It says, without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we see two things here that God's a respecter of faith, and it says He's a respecter of those who diligently seek Him. We have two things there that attract God to you. When a person has faith in God, it brings His presence. When a person seeks God, it brings His presence. God is attracted to those qualities in our lives that He's put in His Word that will attract Him. Yes. Amen? Yes. So... Well, I want to look, but there's one particular area that I'm going to just really focus on for just a short time tonight, um, and this is the area that has really kind of become a very strong um, 
what can I say? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's an area that I just feel like we need to just look at for a moment. And it's an area that is under great assault in society. It's an area that our children are having their faith destroyed because of the area of the creation um, of this universe and the creation of this world. And I used to think, well, you know, it's, 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 they're textbooks, they're, they're taught about creation, they're taught about, the, they're actually taught about evolution, that, that, and, and evolution, it's not that God can't use evolution, God could use that process if he wants to. The issue is that our children are being taught that there is the creation of this universe and the creation of our world and the creation of human beings divorced from the living God. That means that God gets no credit. And if you begin to imbibe an understanding that God is not involved in the creation of your world and your life, you have undermined a very, very significant area that will repel God and also that will cause a person to really have um, a wrong path dictated to their future. And we can look at our schools and see what's going on in them, and we can see what's happening, and we think, well, it's just an intellectual issue. It's much more than that. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's put up Romans chapter 1. And Romans chapter 1, we're going to look at the Scripture in a slightly different way than maybe we have in the past. Romans chapter 1, it talks about this creation that God made. And I'm going to say that the first thing that God, that attracts God in such a very significant way is acknowledging Him as Creator and acknowledge Him as being the one who put everything in, in, in motion and put everything in space, put everything in life, who created life, who created everything in this universe. Acknowledging God and giving Him credit. It would be like a person running the Olympic Games and winning the gold medal and then the people saying, well, you know, we, we know you won, but it's okay, but we're going to give everything to the person who came second. And give no credit to the guy who came first. You, you don't acknowledge and give credit to who it's due. That is wrong in the eyes of God. The Bible says God's a jealous God. And that is something that is very, very damaging to our relationship. Romans 1 verse 20. For ever since the world was created, people have, been, have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. They don't even have to have a Bible. They just look around. Amen? And God is there. Yes, in verse 21, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship Him as God or even give Him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools and instead of worshipping the, the glorious, ever-living God, they worshipped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. And now verse 24 says, So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. There is the rejection of God. The worst thing that can ever happen to a human being is to be rejected. To be abandoned by God to your own devices is, is, is the worst thing that can happen. I think hell is eternal separation from God. And the Bible says that because people would not acknowledge who He is, would not acknowledge that He made this thing, the whole universe, and made life, and that He created everything, and because man would, would imbibe and embrace that uh, philosophy and that understanding that God abandoned them over to their own devices to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And verse, and verse 24 continued, As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. I was very blessed that Pastor Dan, a few weeks ago, really began to touch on the area of creation. Because we think that maybe a well, it's a, maybe a fairy tale. Well, creation is the, is the central focus. It's the basis upon which everything else rests. And, and, and we as a ministry were so, um, were so concerned about this area that we looked around the world and said, who could we bring in 
to speak to us about creation. And we actually came across um, a, a very famous man by the name of Dr. Gerald Schroeder. Dr. Gerald Schroeder is a, a Jewish a scientist. Um, he lives in Jerusalem. He's been there since 1971. He a, holds a double PhD from MIT. He's a physicist and he's watched six atomic bombs explode. Pastor Dan mentioned and talked about him. We flew him in here to the rock and we recorded Genesis and the Big Bang. Here's a double PhD physicist who knows more about quantum physics, knows more about space and science, and he holds up the scriptures in one hand, holds up the NASA map in the other, and he unfolds day one, day two, day three. And it's six 24-hour periods, and at the same time, it's 14 billion years. And it all depends on which part of the universe that you are viewing it from. He goes into the Hebrew and shows how the creation of the universe is 100%. Day one is 8 billion years. Day two is four. Day three is two, one. And these match exactly to the fossil record. They match to the dinosaurs. They match to everything. Why do we bring him in? Because we wanted to lay a foundation that everything in this Word of God that God gave us is 100% true. And if we don't understand, it's because we haven't understood the science yet. And so, this, this to me was such an incredible thing when Pastor Dan began to share about it, began to pro project it. It's not anti-science to believe Scripture. I come from a very intellectual background. You know, I have a doctorate. I have... Uh, you know, a lot of study and masters and I've done theses and I've been to University of Michigan and I've been to Regent University and I've, 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 I've grown up in an academic world. People think you have to check your, your reason and your intellect at the door in order to embrace faith. But it's not the truth. The bottom line of it is that we were created in the image of God. A friend texted me a, a, a few, maybe a week ago, and, and, and said, you know, well, I'm just so average. I'm just an average person. And the person was being very self-deprecating, very much, you know, put, sort of putting themselves down. I said, no, you're not. None of us are average. I said, you are created in the image of God. You are exceptional. You are created in His image, and you hold in your makeup the most phenomenal, most brilliant creation that you can ever ever think about. We're going to look at that. We're going to do a little bit of a biology lesson tonight. Is that okay? Yes. All right. We're going to go and just, if you do the first slide of the PowerPoint, and um, you look at a guy's finger and you see a, a, a pin, which is, uh, you know, um, you can see basically the size of it. We're going to be zooming in on top of that pin. So let's just go to the next slide and we go down and it'll, you'll see so, so, uh, shortly a human hair. Just keep going in. Keep going to the next slide, next slide, next slide. We're going in closer, and you start to see a human hair. There it is now. Stop it right there. So you can see the size of a human hair, very, very tiny. On top of that pin, remember the size of the fingernail and the finger that was there. Let's keep going in, and we're going to go in closer onto the top of that pin. There's a dust mite, all right? You see the, you see the human hair at the background? Now... We're going to go even closer. We're going to go down that little tiny speck next to the dust mite. And we're going to go in and we're going to come into the next thing here, which is going to be, I believe, ragweed pollen. That's the size of ragweed pollen. And we go even closer and we go to a lymphocyte. And that's the size of that. And then we go even closer there. And there we have red blood cells. All right, we're going to stop there. That is a human red blood cell. That's the size of one cell. Every human being on the entire earth was once that size. In fact, all of us spent at least half an hour of our lives that size. Now, I want you to remember from, the si from where we went in, remember the dust mite, when we went in closer, and we're now at the size of one human cell. Now, we can come back to, to the thing, we'll maybe put that up again in a moment. Every person in your body right now has a hundred trillion of those cells. You were all one cell at one time. You've now grown in your body has about 100 trillion cells. Some say 80, 90, 100. We just taken a number. It's close to 100 trillion cells are in your body. Inside each of one cell, we're talking about one of that, 
that tiny, tiny one cell, every one of you that were once, once that size, consists of 23 pairs of chromosomes, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, and 46 total chromosomes. And conception brings those two, and the miracle of the joining of those chromosomes is what creates life. So we are, we're, we're pretty much, I think, everything you've, I'm saying you've learned in biology in school. Now, the chromosomes contain the DNA and, ge and genetic material of, of a person's life. Now, we're going to now just look at inside that one tiny cell. And remember how small it is. We're going to look now at the genetic material, the DNA that's inside of you. All right? The genetic material has three billion base pairs. Inside that one single cell is a code that is written with three billion letters. It's written out in an extremely complex form. That one cell has three billion base pairs. If you uncoil the DNA in one cell, that tiny, tiny, tiny cell, and you uncoil the length of the DNA, the, the, the little tiny uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, which is that little cell, in that one tiny cell, that would unstring to being five feet tall. That's how tall in one cell. If you took all the DNA in your body, it would stretch from here on the earth to the sun and back, 500 times. That's how much DNA you have in your body. One person. Alongside the DNA in one cell are 25,000 genes or genetic uh, makeups. 25,000 genes are alongside those um, DNA strands. Each of the 25,000 genes in that, in that tiny cell is consisted and made up of a thousand different amino acids. And that gene provides a code to build about a hundred thousand proteins that your body needs every single day to function. About 55,000 of those proteins that are developed from that one tiny code, we're talking still the size of a speck here that you can barely see with the human eye. If you look at the, at, at, at the makeup now, it now enables your body to build 55,000 enzymes. And if your body is missing one enzyme out of 55,000, you die. Not 10, not 20. Any single, one single enzyme that is encoded into that one cell, you miss one enzyme, you're dead. It took scientists 13 years to map out the human genome. It's called the Genome Project. There were 20 lab centers working in six countries with dozens of scientists in each lab, costing $3 billion it cost to do it. Just the UK lab had 87 scientists. You may ask why I know about this, because I'm actually writing a book called Pursuing Maturity, where I'm researching on this topic. And to me, it just boggles the mind to see the intricacy, to see the incredible complexity it took it took 13 years with hundreds of scientists in 20 labs costing 3 billion US dollars to figure out the code in one cell. That's how long it took. If you actually wrote out that code, and these guys were using supercomputers that could map 40 million base pairs a day. They're supercomputers, that they could map that. It still took them 13 years to do the job. All right? They basically, if you took that code and wrote it out, it would, it would, and you put it into a phone book, the phone book would stretch to the height of the Washington Monument, 555 feet of code. Now, you want to understand that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And when our teachers t tell us that all of this happened by chance. You know what? The science does not say that. Amen? The science says that it was a creator that made it. That's an instruction manual to build your life. It contains all your genetic history. Now, 
this one code inside that one tiny cell contains all of the genetic history going back to the first human being on the entire planet, and it contains all of the future generations. It's not just a blob of tissue. We're talking about an incredible creation of God. In 2003, President Clinton in the East Ring of the White House was when they completed the Genome Project. He said this when they completed this 13 years and they, they finally had the code of one cell. He said, today we are learning the language in which God created life. We are gaining ever more awe for the complexity, the beauty, and the wonder of God's most divine and sacred gift. Francis Collins, the scientist who headed up the Genome Project, has written a book called The Language of God. Now, you must realize that when conception happens, you're taking all of the genetic material of one human being and all the genetic material of another human being, putting it together into creating a person. That person's unique. person's got an entirely different personality. Everything about them is different. It's like merging a million AT&T companies with a million Apple companies and merging all of their data and all of their information and putting them into a completely cohesive, functioning whole. That's similar to what we're talking about. It's probably a lot more complex than that. I want you to think about that when a conception happens and you are one cell, that you have now the code that now determines the following things. It's a tiny speck, but think about how the code has to turn that speck of a cell into every kind of system and structure that now allows you to live. Think about the organs of the brain and the heart, the liver, the eyes, the ears, the kidneys, the digestive system, the reproduction system. You know, Dr. Richard Kanga, you know, told me that when he opened up a body for the first time and he looked inside, he was like, it, it, it raised his faith through the roof. He's like, there's no way that this came by chance. Amen? Remember the tiny cell contains such complexity, such wisdom, such intricate intelligence. The multiplicity of processes that unfold during an entire human life are predetermined and governed by it. The code of one cell encapsulates life itself, something a lab has never been able to replicate. Your body has a hundred trillion of these cells. And you remember that this, this, this one cell has the ability to, to build a human brain, capable of storing not only information, but carrying human intelligence, consciousness, thoughts, ideas, dreams, and visions. Even more profound is that the cell's ability to create emotion, the conscience, perception, relationships, spirituality, and intimacy. You've got to think that that one code in that one cell has not just the capacity to create life, it, it governs the entire life, it governs your breathing right now. It governs every communication in your body. It governs everything from one tiny code. It governs everything about your entire being from the beginning of conception to the day that you go to be with Jesus. Some facts about your body. Your body has 60,000 miles of blood vessels. If you strung your blood vessels out, it would stretch two and a half times around the entire world just in one human body. The surface area of your lungs is equal to about the size of a tennis court. The impulses from your brain, they travel at 170 miles an hour to every part of your body. A person's liver performs over 500 different functions. A person's nose can remember 50,000 different scents. You have about 206 bones in your body, but just to take one step as you walk, it uses about 200 different muscles just to move and take one step. A human eye can differentiate over 10 million different colors. And during a lifetime, a human heart will pump about 1.5 million barrels of blood. Each human kidney contains a million fibers that clean about a gallon of blood every three minutes. And every hour, your body is generating 100 billion new red blood cells, about 400 million white blood cells. That's about 29 million blood cells that are being generated in your body right now every second. That's every single second. 29 million blood cells are being created in your body. Wow. Isn't it amazing that David wrote and said, I am fearfully and wonderfully 
made. Even on your worst day, when you feel the most depressed and you feel you have the least amount of self-esteem, you should be able to look in the mirror and say, God, you are amazing. This is an amazing creation. Every one of us is exceptional. Every one of us is made in His image. David wrote and he said, I will praise you. He actually started off in Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you. For I am fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Amen. Amen. Dr. Anthony Flew was a British professor who taught at Oxford University in the area of philosophy and religion. One of the world's most renowned atheists. He published over 30 books on atheism. 30 books that denounced God and that said that atheism was the way forward. At the age of 81, he changed from being an atheist to believing in God. Based primarily on DNA research and scientific discovery, Flew wrote in 2004, my one and only piece of relevant evidence for God is the apparent, the apparent impossibility of providing a naturalistic theory of the origin from DNA of the first reproducing species. He's saying it's impossible when you look at DNA, when you look at the complexity of life, when you look at this code and you see how complex it is. You know, they talk about a moth and it's changing color. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an origin of a code that is so complex it has to change at that level before it can ever change out on the surface. And God is the one who created it. In 2007, in an interview with Benjamin Weicker, Flew said again that his deism was the result of a growing empathy with the inside of Albert Einstein and other noted scientists, that there had to be an intelligence behind the integrated complexity of the physical universe. And my own insight that the integrated complexity of life itself, which is far more complex than the physical universe, can only be explained in terms of an intelligent source. He's saying, is no way it happened by chance. He wrote a book called, There is No God. And he crossed out the no and put A. There is a God. At the age of 81, he looked at the evidence and saw that there is a God that made you. It's a God that created you. And so I wanted just to lay that really as a, that when you don't give God credit for who you are, you don't give God credit for the creation that he's made for this world around us. We need to fight for our young people to be taught the truth about, about you know, what science really says. Because the scientists teaching them are teaching them lies. You cannot divorce that code and the, the source of life itself. That doesn't even begin to touch on the intricacies of nature and the intricacies of the sky and, and of the atoms and of everything that's in the created universe, God is in all of it, if you take a look. Amen? Amen. So, I would say that attracting God, number one, you have to acknowledge that He is the source. He is your creator. You cannot doubt who he is. You cannot doubt and say, God, well, I, maybe I wasn't created by you, but maybe not. We have to give him credit for the creation that we are. Amen? Amen. That is foundational to us. And then we need to look at the other areas that God now attracts him. We are made in God's image. So very much the things that attract us from our children are the same things that attract God when we are His children. Amen? So let me just look at my wife's a preschool teacher, and I'll just give you some things that, um, that don't attract you to your children. When your children are mean, when they're dishonest, when they're manipulative, when they're rebellious, when they're ungrateful, when they're unkind, when they're jealous, when they won't share, when they're hurtful, when they're unloving, and when they're selfish. How many of you as parents understand that does not attract you to your children whenever any of those qualities are being manifested? Amen? But when your children are truthful, when they're grateful, when they're polite, when they're helpful, when they're kind, when they're generous, 
when they're heartfelt, when they're genuine, when they're trusting, and when they're loving, does that attract your children to you? Think about us to the living God. Whenever we display those qualities, God is attracted to us. It attracts God into our lives. Amen? I want to look at just a few other things that attract God to us. Giving Him credit for the universe and for our creation is to me a foundational one. Having faith, as we talked about earlier, without faith it's impossible to please Him. And so faith is a, somehow God loves faith. And a person doesn't have faith and doesn't believe and doesn't trust Him. It's like your, fa- your, your child saying to you, you know, Dad, well, I, you know, you're a wonderful dad, but I just don't know if you're going to provide food for us tonight. I'm not sure whether you're going to be able to do it. And, you know, if your child ever dis- displayed to you a lack of trust that you would take care of them, how would you feel as a parent? You would, you know, would push them away. It would, be, it would be offensive, it would be hurtful to a father. His own child did not respect him as a provider. So God respects faith. He respects when we acknowledge and give him credit for who he is. And then God respects sacrifice. And Pastor Luke preached a lot about that this morning, about the sacrifice and just how you know, Abel brought something that was sacrificial and he brought something that was his first and his best and he didn't have a, he brought it by faith because he didn't have a second born, he only had a first born. But he brought the first born and he offered it to God knowing that God would, offer, would, would take care of him. Abraham sacrificed Isaac, was his first and his best. He didn't have a second child from Sarah, he only had one. And God required it. It wasn't the fact that God wanted to kill Isaac. Well, God was requiring a sacrificial heart. And the sacrifice that Abraham was saying, God, I don't know, you have to raise this one child from the dead or however you're going to do it, but I'm going to trust you. My first and my best is yours. And he put him on the altar and that brought about salvation to all of the whole world. Amen? Because God is attracted by sacrifice. God is attracted when a person does something that's sacrificial, when a person gives of themselves, and when they give of their first, not having any guarantee that they'll have a second. Amen? God is attracted by prayer and by alms, by giving. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, we see the story there. It says that he sees an angel by the same by the side of the altar. And Cornelius is a centurion. He's a Gentile. He's not even a Jew. And he's there giving alms and he's praying. And he sees the angel standing and, 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 and you know, he's like, what is it, Lord? Why are, you, why are you here? What's this angel there for? And it says there in verse 4, it says that when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. You know, a person who's got a heart of prayer and a person who does right to the poor and helps people, it attracts God. I'm not saying that you earn God's, you know, that you earn something from God. I'm just saying that you generate favor in the same way as you have a humble heart, you know, you earn God's favor. But a person, this man was so faithful that he prayed daily and he gave And he earned the favor of God. And God chose to appear to this Gentile man to open up the Gentiles. The whole Gentile world was opened up through the house of Cornelius. Through the prayers and the giving of a faithful man who didn't even have full revelation of what he was doing. But he had a heart that was sacrificial and that gave prayer and alms to God. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. God is touched and God is attracted by persistence. I don't even really understand how, you know, you think, well, you know, if you get God's attention, then, but sometimes you, you, you pray and, and nothing happens and you pray again and nothing happens and a lot of people just give up at that point. But something touches God's heart and attracts God when a person is persistent. There's the woman with the... With the you know, the widow story that Jesus told. But this one here, blind Bartimaeus, Mark chapter 10. They came to Jericho, Mark chapter 10, verse 46. He went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. 
When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. There's something about a persistent cry, persistence with God that, that attracts him, that draws God to you. And when a person is not going to give up and say, God, you know, there's the lady that Jesus kind of pushes away and says, I can't take the bread and feed it to the, child, to the children's bread and feed it to the dogs. And she says, yes, God, but even the dogs eat the, the bread under the table. And Jesus said, okay, all right, I'll let you do because the persistence of that woman touched the heart of Jesus. Amen. We don't give up. Amen. And we've got to keep fighting. We've got to keep walking. We've got to keep praying. We've got to keep seeking. We've got to keep, you know, going after and being persistent with God because it touches and it draws God. It attracts God to you. God respects gratitude. The leper who returned in Luke 17. We read the story of ten lepers getting healed. And nine of them don't go, they just go. It was nine that got healed and one of them, only one came back. In verse 15 of Luke 17, and one of them, this leper that had been healed, when he saw that he was healed, he returned and with a loud voice glorified God. He fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. He wasn't even a Jewish person. Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Were there not any found who returned to give God the glory except this foreigner? He said to him, rise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. There's something about gratitude that touches the heart of God. And when God has done something for you and you, when you give it back to him and you, and you have a grateful heart, it attracts God to you. Amen? Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen? I want to touch on the fact that humility in a contrite heart. You know, we mentioned that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. There's something about a, a, a humble heart that is so attractive to God. The Bible actually says this in Psalm 51. When David, when David had committed murder and adultery, he had done both of those sins. And he now was very, very repentant. And David writes in Psalm 51, 7, he says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, and a contrite, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. And then there's a heart that is really broken and really contrite before God, really humbles. And the Bible says we can choose to humble ourselves. It's one of the things we can do, that it attracts God to us. But if we have a proud and an arrogant spirit and we start fighting against God, it repels Him. God respects generosity. Mark 12, verse 41, Jesus sat opposite the treasury, saw how the people put the money in the treasury. He doesn't say He saw how much He put them, He saw how He put them. In. Many were rich, put in much. And one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. He called his disciples to himself and said to them, Surely I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. They put in their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. I just have just two more. Can we, can we touch on them? See, Jesus looked at how much. No, it wasn't how much in terms of two mites. It was how much of what she had. God looks at your sacrifice and there again we, we see it. That when a person's heart is behind their giving and that woman gave everything she had, she gave all of her livelihood, Jesus said the woman's put in more than anybody else. Because it's not how much, it's how much of what God's given you. That's how much that touches the heart of God. God respects acts of love. The woman with the alabaster jar. He was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper in Mark chapter 14. And it says that he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster flask, a very costly oil of spikenard. She broke the flask, poured it on his head. But there were some who had been, were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? It might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. They criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish you can do them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. 
Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. I'll tell you, Jesus really respects and acts of love. Amen. God respects right priorities. Matthew 6, you all know that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else, all these things shall be added to you. And finally, God respects a seeking and knocking and an asking heart. The Bible says, ask and it will be given to you. Matthew 7, 7. Seek and, it will and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and who knocks, the door will be opened. See, God will move on your behalf. That in any one of these areas, and I'm, I'm just in a place where I'm saying, God, we're all on a level playing field. We all, you know, have to enter by the blood of the cross. We all, you know, before God, none of us can violate the word of God. We can't violate the laws of God. We don't, God doesn't have any special favorites that this person can get away with it, but that person cannot. We're all in a level playing, playing field. I'm saying, God, I, I want to do in my life what attracts you. I want to do everything that attracts you. And I want to do whatever, I don't want to do what repels you. Amen. 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 So I close with a story. It's a true story out of Cincinnati. It comes, uh, it's, it deals with springboard diving. Actually, I used to do springboard diving when I was in South Africa growing up. And um, had a great love for, for high diving. I didn't used to do the tower, but uh, this guy did. And um, it's called the shadow of the cross. And just to see the orchestration of God when a person is beginning to seek him and how God can orchestrate every facet of his life to be able to bring him to that place of salvation. While taking a class in photography at the University of Cincinnati, a Christian became acquainted with a young man named Charles Murray, who also was a student at the school training for the Summer Olympics as a high diver. Charles was very patient, listening to him, the Christian, for hours about how Jesus had saved him. Charles was not raised in a home that attended any kind of church, so all that was told to him was as a, fasc a fascination. He even began to ask questions about the forgiveness of sins. Finally, the day, day came that the question was put to him. Have you realized your need of a Savior and a Redeemer? Are you ready to trust Christ as your Savior? His countenance fell and the guilt was in his face. But he did not accept at that point. In the days that followed, he was quiet and often avoided the believer until one day Charles decided to call him. He wanted to know where to look in the New Testament for some verses about salvation. He declined to meet, but thanked the Christian for the scriptural references. He was greatly troubled, but was not ready to receive help. Because he was training for the Olympic Games, Charles had a special privileges at the university pool facilities. Sometime between 10.30 and 11 that evening, he decided to go and swim and practice a few dives. It was a clear night in October and the moon was big and bright. The university pool was housed under a ceiling of glass pane so the moon shone bright across the top of the wall in the pool area. So he climbed to the highest platform to take his first dive. At that moment, the Spirit of God began to convict him of his sins. All the scriptures he had read, all the occasions of witnessing to him about Christ flooded his mind. He stood on the platform backwards to make his first dive, spread his arms to gather his balance. He looked up on the wall and saw his own shadow caused by the light of the moon. It was in the shape of a cross. He could bear the burden of his sin no longer. His heart broke and he sat down on the platform and asked God to forgive him and save him. He trusted Jesus Christ 20 some feet in the air. Suddenly the lights in the pool area came on. The attendant had come in to check the pool. As Charles looked down from the platform, he saw an empty pool which had been drained for repairs. He had almost plummeted to his death, but the cross had stopped him from disaster. Amen. If we take one step towards God, He'll take a hundred towards us. Amen. And when we seek Him, we will find Him if we seek Him with all of our hearts. And so with that, I just covered your prayers as I traveled to China, as we travel to take the gospel. But I just challenge all of us, let's, let's give God the glory that is His. Let's give Him what's due to His name. He is our God. He is our Creator. We will never be ashamed of Him. We will never be ashamed to acknowledge His creation. Hey, I want to talk to you guys before you leave this place. I want to make sure that your heart's right with God. Just like that man who was standing on that platform 20 feet in the air, wrestling 
with a decision. Some of you came into the house of God tonight and you're wrestling with that same decision. Do I really believe in an invisible God for my salvation and for my life? And you came tonight searching. And I know that God spoke to you. That the words that Dr. Barron ministered tonight, they cut you to the heart. And you know, examining your heart and your life tonight, sitting in those seats, that if you were to leave this place and you died, that you don't know where you would go. You might be thinking, well, I, I really do hope that my church attendance tonight was enough that if there is a God, that he would see that and appreciate that and get me into heaven. But can I tell you something? No one in the Bible does it say church attendance gets you into heaven. Did you know that? For a lot of people, that's shocking. Wait a second. Isn't it about going to church? Some of you in this place, if you died, you'd say, I, 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 I really do want to go to heaven, but I, I really don't know. But the Bible says you've got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Some of you say, maybe I would go to heaven. Maybe, maybe not. I don't, I don't really know. Tonight, let's make sure that you know where you're going to go before you leave this place. Give me a couple minutes of your attention, and then I'll let you go. There's no other way you're going to get to heaven except God's way. Just like we heard tonight, there are things that attract God, things that please God. And then there are things that repel God or displease Him. In the same way, God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who you heard amazing proof tonight of His existence, of his creation, of his wisdom, but also of his infinite love. That if God is the creator, if God is the one who started it all, if God's the one who wrote the plan of redemption and carried it out in his son Jesus, if he did all that, then that means it's God's heaven and we got to get there God's way. And we can't get there your way, can't get there my way, can't get there religion's way or man's way. we got to get there God's way. And God did not say, just go to church. God didn't say, clean up your act and be good. God didn't say, volunteer or serve at a church. God didn't say, know something about me. No, Jesus came and he said these words. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know. I know that our society has raked that term through the coals. They made it out to be a mockery, some weirdo, goofy thing. And yet being born again is not what society, Hollywood, movies, television, books, and the internet say it is. Being born again is what the Bible says it is. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. Just like that man standing there, staring at a vision of the cross. At that moment, he sat down and he gave God all of his heart and he gave God all of his life. The same way tonight, I want to give you this opportunity to give God all of your heart and to give God all of your life. Tonight, you have been confronted with the truth. God is speaking to your heart right where you're at, and he's calling you to himself and saying, will you just release your control of your life and let me be Lord and Savior? Lord means boss, the leader. Will you let me lead your life, take care of you and protect you, love you, encourage you, walk you through the trials and the storms? If that's you tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity just like this. I'm going to count to three and then pop my hand right here on this pulpit just like this. One, two, three, bang. When you hear the sound of my hand pop on this pulpit just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, well, wait a second, wait a second, Pastor. You know, uh, I might be embarrassed if I do that. People will see me raise my hand. Yeah, they might but that's okay. Because isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. And yet tonight, your flesh is going to try and talk you out of this. Oh, no, you'll be embarrassed. Don't do that. Devil's whispering in your ear. Come on. This is just emotions. You don't have to do it. You're good enough to make it. Listen, we've already discussed that. No one in the Bible will say, be good, and that'll get you in heaven. You must be born again. This is how you get into heaven, is you give God all your heart, give God all of your life, and you serve him, love him, fear him, follow him throughout your days. He who endures to the end shall be saved. So tonight, 
This is your opportunity. This is your time. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. And listen, we love you. This is a warm welcome church. We're all excited for you tonight, so no one's criticizing, no one's condemning, no one's judging. If your hand goes up, we're not looking at you like, oh, no, that's a bad, no, that's a good thing. This is the best decision of your life. Tonight, will you give God all your heart? Will you give God all your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Tonight, come on, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given him all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand in this place? If you're lukewarm in your heart, you say, lukewarm, what is that? That means a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. A little church attendance every now and then. A little prayer every now and then. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. Listen, Jesus said, I want to find you hot or cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Listen, tonight, if that's you in this place, lukewarm, maybe you've been playing church. Maybe you at one time prayed a prayer, but you didn't follow it up. Listen, come on, tonight. Let's go all out for Jesus Christ. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or in the Love Rock Cafe. Come on, get ready to get your hand up and then tell an usher or come into this church service right afterwards. If you're online, hey, God sees you wherever you're at, across the nation and around the world. And he sees your hand go up and then right afterwards you can click the button next to your browser that says respond to God or on our homepage, how to know God. I'm going to count to three, pop my hand on this pulpit. And if that's you, get ready to get your hand up all together on the count of three. One, two, Three, let me see your hand. Just raise it up high for me right now. Thank you. There's one. God bless you. Who else tonight? There's two. There's three. God bless you guys. Who else? There's four. Got you up there. Thank you. Anybody else in this place? You're saying, I need to give God. Thank you. Five. God bless you. Need to give God all my heart. Need to give God all my life. Got you guys already. You can put your hands down. Thank you. Up there. Thank you. There's six. God bless you. Who else today? You're saying, yeah, I know I need to do this. There's seven. Anybody else? Come on. If that's you, just raise it up high for me. Right now, thank you. There's eight. Got you, my man. Good job. Good good call. Anybody else? Listen, I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. If you need to do this, it's just this easy. Simply raising your hand and acknowledging your need, and then we're going to pray together. Who else in this place today? You're saying, I know I need to give God all my heart. No, I need to give God all my life. There's eight wise people already. Don't you know there's a number nine and a number ten in this place? You're sitting there saying, ah, you're wrestling tonight. Wrestling tonight. Come on, look to that cross. Jesus is waiting for you with open arms. He loves you. Anybody else? I'm going to wrap this up in a moment. Don't miss this opportunity. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for eight wise people tonight. Hallelujah. God is so good. All right, all eight of you that raised your hand, or if you're number nine, number 10, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. Quickly, once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies tonight. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. Let's all stand, and you come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come down. You come right now. Come on down. Even if you didn't raise your hand, you can come too. Come on. This is your time and this is your moment. From the family rooms, if you raise your hand or your children raise your hand, bring them down right now. Come on. They're coming. Come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. They're still coming. Come on. You can come too. And I surrender all. Hallelujah. They're still coming. Come on. There's room for you here at the altar. You just come on down right now. Make your way to the front. My blessed Savior, I surrender all. All right, all right. Hey, they're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Listen, if you know you need to come, you can just start walking down here. I'm going to give some instructions, but that doesn't mean it's too late. You can still come, okay? So if you know you need to, race down here right now. Come on, take that first step. The rest will be easy. Hi, you guys. Hey, everybody up front. Look up here for a second. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. This is the best decision of your entire life right here. Listen, it's all about to change from the inside. God's going to come into your heart and make you brand new. You're going to be a new creation. Jesus is going to come in, and you're going to be born again. Now, listen, we want to 
lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Right over here to my right, your left. See this guy over here waving at you? This is Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again. Then he's going to give you some free information, some free literature to read about what just happened. Okay? Now that I'm a Christian, what do I do next? Okay? He'll give that to you absolutely free. It's easy reading. You can sit down probably half hour. You know, read it if you're reading it slow. And it'll help you just to understand, now that I'm a Christian, what do I do next? And then finally, he's going to talk to you about a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Can I describe it to you like this? It's a friend in church. It's easy and it's free. Okay, we just want to encourage you. Bring a friend alongside you to help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. All right, now listen. Let me make a promise to you guys. Give us a year of your life here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. One year, okay? Sitting consistently under the teaching here at the Rock. Listen, you're going to get some strong, healthy messages like you heard tonight. After that year... And for the rest of your life, you will look around and you will say, oh my goodness, I did not know it could be this good. I am so blessed. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. Take their word for it, okay? It all starts with a spiritual personal trainer. It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it, okay? So if you guys would make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way, let's give him a hand as they go. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.